hard, and eventually God is going to destroy them. And interestingly, when he said he was going to destroy them, he said he's going to reduce them down to a stump. So he's using tree imagery, and in verse 13, Isaiah 6, 13, it says, There will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. So the faithful remnant will be the stump of Israel and Judah. Well, one of the axes that God used to chop down the tree of his people and reduce his people to the stump was the king of Assyria. And what was his attitude? What was the attitude of the axe? You remember? <clears throat> Yeah, all right, the axe is boasting itself against the one who wields it. The axe is saying, I am more powerful than God, even though God is the one who's, who's wielding the axe to accomplish his purposes. So as an act of judgment against Assyria and their king, God promises to pick up a different axe and to chop Assyria down. So in sort of this poetic justice way, the axe that was doing all the chopping of the trees now becomes the tree that's going to get chopped down. And it's because of their arrogance. And we learned about that at the end of chapter 10. In chapter 10, in verse 33, uh, Behold, the Lord, the God of hosts, will lop off the boughs with a terrible crash. Those also who are tall in stature will be cut down, and those who are lofty will be abased. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron axe, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So, so now what I'm doing is I'm showing you there, there are two trees that have been chopped down and reduced to stumps. One is the people of God, and the other is the Assyrians. And of course, that's going to happen later with Babylon. Babylon's going to be the axe that chops the Assyrians down. Okay, but, but what I want you to see now is there's a major difference between these two stumps. And it is that the Assyrian stump will never grow or bear fruit again. But look what happens to the stump of God's people. Now in today, chapter 11, verse 1, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So the difference between the stump of Assyria and the stump of God's people is there's hope for God's people. God's tree will grow and bear fruit again one day, and it's all going to start with a single shoot. I think this is a really cool application. It's one of the differences between Christians and non-Christians, right? All of us are sort of equally reduced to stumps by the sinfulness of our own choices and decisions. But for the Christian, there's always hope to grow again and, and to bear fruit again because we're relying on God's forgiveness and power. We're no, long, we're no better than non-Christians. We're just leaning on God. Now, who is Jesse? It says the stem of Jesse. Yeah, David's father, okay. Um, it's a little interesting. He, he could have said that this shoot is coming from the stem of David. He doesn't say that. I, I wonder if the reason he's doing that is because he's presenting this shoot as a new David. Okay, he's going to be David 2.0. Because David, he was a mighty king, a warrior king, but also look how sinful and how flawed he was and all that stuff with Bathsheba and all that. Okay, but this ultimate salvation, is, it can't come from David. It has to come from God's true king, the new David. In fact, some of the prophets, they, they just say, God is sending David again. They don't even say he's sending a king like David. They just say, God's sending David. I think Jeremiah says that. Uh, so so I, I wonder if that's how he's presenting him here. Um, it's also interesting that he, um, let's see, yeah, let me, if we have a stump here, Okay, and then we have this shoot that comes out. The stump is kind of like the stem of Jesse, okay, and, and he's going to shoot out from this stem. And, but, but what's interesting, he, he says he's not only coming from the stem of Jesse, he's also coming from the roots, from the roots of Jesse, too. So it's almost like this shoot is connecting to the future of Jesse, but he's also connecting back to the past from where Jesse came from. Okay, so this future stem idea is the idea of a new David is coming, right? This new king in the future, but he connects all the way back to the roots of where David came from and where Jesse came from, which was Abraham, right? The, the, the ultimate root where God says, your seed, I'm going to raise up to be a blessing to, to all the world. Um, look in chapter four and verse two, and then I'll get to your, I see your hand, David. Give me one more second here. Isaiah four, in verse 2, because we had a similar 
language used here. Chapter 4, verse 2, In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. So, so all throughout these chapters, Isaiah has been giving us various pictures of the Messiah and the peace under his reign. He's a branch coming to bear fruit. Uh, in chapter 2, he's, he lifts God, God's mountain up to be higher than all the other mountains and kingdoms and all the nations stream to him there. In chapter 9, he's a wonderful counselor, a mighty God. He has an eternal kingdom. And now in chapter 11, which we'll cover today, we're given another picture of what the Messiah is like and what it's like to be under his reign. So that's sort of the big picture of this chapter is the hope uh, that's coming from this felled stump. Any questions, comments uh, through verse 1 before we continue in, in chapter 11? David, do you have something? Is, is this Jesus that he's talking about? Yes, I believe it absolutely is Jesus. Yep, and that, I think that will become clearer, you know, the more we go through the chapter. Uh, but yeah, yep, this is going to be Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate descendant of David. Uh, how often in the Gospels is Jesus called the son of David? Because um, David was promised in 2 Samuel 7, you'll have an everlasting dynasty, and someone will always be sitting on, on your throne. It's interesting how much parallelism you'll see when using that trees, trees in the, the yes. tree of life. Yes. Um, you know, the tree that will, that, that, that the, from, from Jesse to what was become to, you know, Jesus says, I am the branch, right? I, I mm -hmm. am the vine. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of interesting parallelism that you just can dive right into for that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the connection between trees and humans is all over Scripture. You know, Psalm 1, what's the wise human like? A tree firmly planted by streams of water, right? When, when human beings are having children, what is, how is that described? Being fruitful and, and multiplying. It's tree language, right? So, tree, yeah, there's trees from start to finish in the Bible. Awesome to see all those connections. And Jesus you know, he's going to die on a tree, right? And the, the, the tree that he dies on becomes the tree of life, you know, for us. And uh, man, this is so cool. We see the tree of life at the end of the Bible. So cool. And, and so often what you see in Isaiah is God's people are described as a tree that are supposed to be fruitful or a vineyard, right? As an agriculture, they're supposed to be fruitful, but they haven't been. And that's why God chops them down. And Jesus comes, he says the same thing. He says, I've come. If any tree doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to chop them down, throw them into the fire. So just really cool. All right, well, let's look at what the shoot of Jesse is actually going to be like, because he describes what he's going to be like uh, in verses 2 through 5. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. So in the Bible, people's character was described by the kind of spirit that they had in them. If you're a mean person, you know, you've, we, we still do that today. We'll say he's mean-spirited. <laughs> we still kind of do that same. Uh, and so if he's got the spirit of the Lord, it means he's like God in his character. And specifically, he's perfectly wise, okay, which means he can discern right from wrong. He has understanding. He knows what life is all about. And because of his wisdom and understanding, he gives good counsel. This connects back to chapter 9 where he's called Wonderful Counselor. Um, he has strength, which could imply miraculous power of God, the, the miraculous strength of God, but also maybe perseverance. Um, he knows God's will, and he reveres God. Uh, if you think about it, these are great character qualities to look for when appointing elders. And, and of course, Jesus, he's going to rate perfectly in all of these qualities. And if you count these qualities, guess how many qualities there are listed? Seven. Okay, and maybe this is why John in Revelation refers to the Holy Spirit as the seven spirits of God, uh, because the Holy Spirit sort of captures the completeness of God's character and, and spirit, and Jesus is going to have these qualities. Now, do you remember what sign John the Baptist said he was supposed to look for in order to identify the Messiah? <clears throat> He didn't recognize him at first as the Messiah, but then something happened that was supposed to signal that, that he actually was the Messiah. Um, 
it, it's in John 1 and verse 33, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and repainting upon him. Yeah, right? It was at Jesus' baptism that the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus. And that was the evidence given to John the Baptist that you'll know he is the one. Right? This is the fulfillment of the Spirit of the Lord, of Isaiah 11, the Spirit of the Lord resting upon him. And what's, what else is awesome is you keep reading in that verse in John 1.33, he says it's also the sign that he is the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. So John, John is, he's not only told that when the Spirit comes upon Jesus, that confirms he's the Messiah. This also proves that he's going to be the one to send that same Spirit that is upon him upon us. And that's a really awesome thought. Earlier I mentioned those are good qualities for elders. Really, it's, it's good qualities for all of us because all Christians have the Spirit of the Lord upon us because Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit when we you know, come up out of the waters of, of baptism. So the Messiah was coming to show us what it looks like to live in alignment with God's character. And then he's coming to give us the ability to live in alignment with God's character too, which is a huge contrast with how God's people were living in Isaiah's day because they were just terrible. They did not have God's spirit in them at all. Um, Verse 3, not only will Jesus honor and revere God, he'll actually delight in it. I love that. As opposed to the people in Isaiah's day who delighted in drunkenness and idolatry and materialism and all that, he actually will delight in God in fearing and serving him. Uh, what does it mean that he won't judge by what his eyes see? Well, he, he judges, um, Jesus judges people by their heart, which only he can see. Okay, there you go. Not the outside actions or words or whatever. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Jesus judges the heart. Okay, he looks past what you can see on the surface. Does this remind you of any verse in the New Testament that, that Jesus said about that? about how to judge people. <laughs> it's not the one where he says, don't judge lest you be judged. This is a, this is a different one. <clears throat> In John 7, he says, judge not according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's Isaiah 11, right? He's, he's fulfilling that. He's the true judge who doesn't just allow the looks of things to deceive him. He sees through it all to the truth of the matter. Uh, And verse 4, as opposed to the corrupt judges in Isaiah's day, he'll actually take care of the poor. He'll he'll take the poor into account in his judgments. Remember remember the judges in Isaiah's day. I mean, they're just raking the poor people over the coals. They're taking bribes and they're, you know, ruling against the poor because the poor can't do anything for them. But Jesus is totally different. He's going to judge them with fairness. And since he's a new David, he's going to be a warrior king who who goes out and defeats all of his enemies with with a sword and, um, you know, a a belt and armor and all that. But, But what's different about the way he fights? It's a little bit unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So he's not using the conventional weapons of war, like armor and guns and you know slings and all that stuff. He he's he's not using a literal sword, right? But he's using the the sword of of his word. Um, he uses the truth to expose the lies of his enemies. He he uses righteousness to kind of disarm the, the unrighteous and, um, you know, instead of, it sort of diffuses the hatred of his enemies. His love diffuses the hatred of his enemies. And instead of trusting in human power and alliances and all that, his trust is fully in God. Faithfulness is, you know, the belt around, around his waist. Um, this is exactly what he does, right? He, he comes to speak truth and he condemns sin, which makes his enemies hate him. But then instead of going to physical battle and war with his enemies, he lays down his life for them in righteousness. And he trusts God to take care of him, even to the point of going to the cross. And you look at that, and you're like, how absurd. I mean, that is not the way to win a war, right? I, to go out into battle thinking I can win this fight with just my words and my righteous actions. That's crazy. That, we'd say that's a quick way to get killed. Okay, but Jesus would come to show us that, that loving your enemies to that level, even letting them kill you as you serve them, is the way to defeat our enemies. It's how he turned his earthly enemies into lifelong followers. 
It's how he crushed his spiritual enemies by refusing to give in to hatred and violence, and his death released us all from the bondage of sin. And here's the really cool part. In Ephesians 6, Jesus says, as Christians, this is the kind of armor I want you to wear. That, that this armor, see, we, we would look and say, well, this armor is powerless, right? But Jesus came and showed us it's not. Jesus came and battle-tested this armor, and he said, this is the kind of armor that truly gives you victory over your enemies and over Satan and all of the spiritual forces of wickedness. I tested it out. I've proven that it works, and now I want you to put on. And, you know, Paul goes through the, the, the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the, you know, feet shod with the gospel of peace. He sort of goes into more detail, but Paul's just building off of this idea of Jesus being the ultimate warrior who tested out that armor first. So many rich New Testament connections. This is why I love studying Isaiah, because it's just, there's so many, not just verses that are quoted from Isaiah in the New Testament, which there are, there's dozens of verses, but, but also concepts that you get from Isaiah, that the New Testament writers just assume that you know. They're just playing off of these concepts. It makes it so much richer. Any comments or questions through verse 5? Through verse 5. <clears throat> any applications? Any other thoughts? <clears throat> Yes. But what's harder is to just speak the truth. And I think about even candidates, whether it's your local judges or mayors or whoever, if instead of attacking each other, mm -hmm. if they just would stay calmly Ooh, yeah. and professionally what their platforms is. Here is the truth. Here's what's worked. Here's what doesn't work. That'd be nice. If they would do that, we would learn a lot more. We would yes. have the truth and we could base the Person did that, and that person did that, and mm. being attacking, it's just so hate, it's just so hateful. Yeah. But even if they applied this, it would make things. For sure, yeah. And it's so practical for us, too, because as Christians, we can get caught up in that, too. It's like, okay, your side is bringing out the mud slinging. Well, I'm going to fight fire with fire, right? Well, you're going to sling mud. Well, then I'll just. How do you like it? You know, I'll just sling mud right back in you. But, but Jesus is showing that is not how to win. Like You will actually lose to the demonic forces because you're playing right into Satan's hands. That's why Jesus could not meet hatred and violence with hatred and violence. The only way to defeat the hatred and violence of Satan and his forces and the Jewish religious leaders and all that that Satan was using was to sort of absorb all that hate and violence into his own love. It's to sort of have this receiving energy as opposed to a fighting, resisting energy. It's a receiving energy. I'm just sort of catching all of your hatred and I'm taking it down into the grave with me. And then I'm resurrecting and all that. There's nothing new. Now you don't have any strength. Okay? Um, oh man, it's tempting. I... I I teach Wing Chun Kung Fu, and this is one of the principles of Wing Chun, is relaxation. Because if you are relaxed, the strength of your opponent has, not, has nothing it can do against you. If you're tight and your opponent pushes on you when you're tight, it affects your whole body. Your whole body gets pushed back, and whoever's strongest is going to win. If your opponent is bigger and stronger, you're going to lose because you're fighting force with force, strength with strength. Okay? But if your enemy pushes on you and you relax... All their strength does nothing. I just, I just relax. I just deflect what they're doing. I put it off in a different direction. This is what Jesus did with the cross. Okay, that was not in my notes. A sidebar. Okay, but, <laughs> but I can't help but talk about it sometimes. Um, so anyway, yeah, really good thought. I really appreciate that. And that, that's what the armor is. It's so unexpected. It's a different kind of armor. All right. So Isaiah has already hinted at the peace under the Messiah's reign back in chapter two, where the swords are beaten into plowshares. Remember that? And then in chapter 9, all the army boots and the cloaks covered in blood, they'll be burned because they, they, we won't need them anymore. And now he gives an even more vivid picture of peace under the Messiah's reign. Such an awesome section here. Uh, verses 6 through 10. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. 
Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Uh, why are these images so shocking? <clears throat> Yeah, and they're all mortal enemies, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> one of the main jobs of a shepherd is to keep your sheep away from the wolves. You cannot allow the wolves to say, yeah, come on in and, and sleep in the same pen as my sheep. That is insane. You don't do that. Lions and cows, okay, leopards and goats, they should not be kept in the same room, okay, if you want the cows and the goats to actually survive. But they can dwell in peace in this new kingdom. Wolves and sheep, they can dwell in peace in this new kingdom. And not only that, but lions and leopards and wolves are being led around by a little boy obeying him like their house pets. I mean, you just picture, it's such a cool picture, like a four-year-old, and he's calling to a lion, you know, come here, buddy, let's go, let's go over here. And the lion says, okay, you know, he just follows this, this little boy. It's such a peaceful scene. And in this scene, the lion could do that because the lion is a vegetarian. The, the lion won't eat the boy because he eats straw like an ox. He's, he's not eating meat anymore. Then in another, another scene, you've got a toddler playing with cobras and vipers, okay? all so backwards, so insane. And if you saw a kid doing this, you'd be calling Child Protective Services uh, immediately. Uh, but even poisonous serpents are rendered harmless in this kingdom. No humans or animals are out to hurt or kill each other anymore in God's kingdom on this new mountain because everyone will know God and everyone will know what he accomplished on the cross to bring peace to all of creation. Um, verse 10 um, he's mentioned, he mentions the root of Jesse there, who stands as a standard or a signal or a banner lifted in battle. Um, a, a, a standard or a banner is a flag that marks where the leader is and serves as a rallying point for the soldiers to come to for directions and guidance for, for battle. Um, but, but ironically, look at this. Um, instead of this banner being a rally point for war, it becomes a rally point for rest. Because when we join this warrior king, we can have rest because we know he's already fought the war and won. We don't have to fight each other anymore because he has defeated our real enemy in him. Now we can have peace and we can have rest. It's just a beautiful picture. Uh, in fact, it's a complete reversal of the curse of sin and a restoration back to the Garden of Eden, back in Genesis 1 and 2, because there was peace between humans and animals in the garden because they were all vegetarians. Humans, animals, all vegetarians. Genesis 1, 29 and 30 say that. Humans were not eating animals, and animals were not eating humans. It wasn't until the curse of sin that now there's hostility and there's this animosity between the, the creation. And this may be part of what Romans 8 means, where it says even the animals are groaning under the burden of sin, and they cannot wait until the resurrection when all is restored. Uh, I mean, think about it, like because of sin, right? Like cows have to watch their back because they're about to be slaughtered as used as burgers, okay? And sheep, they got to sleep with one eye open, you know, trying to watch out for, for wolves and all that. But in Jesus' kingdom, all that hostility, all that enmity will be ended. There will be perfect peace to the point where even the worst of enemies become friends. Um, I think the note, too, about the child playing with serpents is a hint that Satan himself will be defeated, that the serpent no longer has any, any power. Um, what's interesting is Paul quotes from verse 10 in Romans 15 in verse 12, saying that we're already experiencing this on some level in, in the church. And so here's my question to you. Obviously, when we look around today, we still see, you know, lions and lambs at odds and all that stuff. Okay, but how is this fulfilled in a figurative way in the church? <clears throat> well, people that are at odds, like ethnicities or races, okay, or yeah. genders or whatever, are brought to peace. There you go. Because we're all one in Christ. Yeah, exactly. It's that oneness. It's that unity. I mean, one of the greatest examples was Saul. I mean, this was a wolf just killing sheep. And what does Jesus do? He he turns Saul into a sheep, right? He, he makes... He makes the wolf lie down together in peace with, with the sheep. And then, yeah, you've got Jews and Gentiles. They absolutely hated each other. Slaves and masters, right? And bringing all that together as one in Christ. Um, 
And of course, I believe there's going to be a more literal fulfillment of this verse in the end when Jesus comes back to restore and resurrect all of creation. I realize my view is different than others on this subject, uh, and it's okay to hold a different view. I just think it matches up best with what we know from, from other verses. But any comments or questions about that section? Mike? I think it's interesting that that's what God's plan was mm. and what the intention was. Mm. But what man did in the church is the same thing that was going on outside of the church. All the person, I mean, through history. Oh, I see. Okay. The church became persecuted other people and right. burned people, and, and they were just as bad as the outside. Yes. They did not follow this at all. They did not. Yeah. I, yeah. They. What were they doing? They were using the weapons of the right. the world's war. Right. They weren't wearing the armor of God. They were t literally taking up the sword instead of the sword of the spirit. Instead of the word of God, they're literally killing people that aren't submitting to Jesus and. It's like that's not that's not what Jesus did. <laughs> that's totally opposite. Yeah. Mm -mm. The reference to in nine to the full knowledge of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So is that in reference to what what, what the, the mystery was to become, or is that something else? Yeah, I think so. The full knowledge there um, is is the idea that once Jesus dies on a cross, that's going to be something that the whole world eventually is going to know about. And it has, I mean, isn't it true that when you get to the book of Acts, the great commission is that they would teach all nations, right? First in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then what? To the remotest parts of the earth. Uh, this goes with other passages to Jeremiah 31. Um, he says, you're not going to have to teach your neighbor, you know, to know the Lord, because everybody's going to know me, you know, in, th in that day. I just dropped my marker. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when, when God rescued... Israel from the Red Sea, and then the people in Canaan had heard about it. When they go to Rahab, they're like, man, our hearts melted when we heard what God did for you. It's like, that was nothing compared to God sending his son to die on a cross, and that message is going to spread everywhere. Everybody's going to know about the Lord. And that's how Jesus can become this signal, this rallying point for the whole nation to come and, and rally around him, essentially. All right. Uh, well, uh, this continues this rallying idea of people, of God gathering his people to him in this, in this next section. He says, then in, it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar and Hamath and from the islands of the sea. He will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. And he will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams and make men walk over dry shod. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. Um, so verse 11, he calls this the second time that God gathers his people with his hand. So probably, there's some debate about this, but, but probably the first time would be after the Babylonian captivity, when God's people, they come back home to, to Jerusalem. Okay, but the second time that he's talking about is now looking forward to the day of the Messiah, this spiritual gathering you know, of, of his people. Um, in other words, he, he views the time of the Messiah as a rescue from captivity too, except they're taken captive to Satan right, and, and to sin, and God is, God is bringing his people back home. Um, and in fact, he says when the Messiah comes, he'll, he'll raise up a standard or a banner as a rallying point for, for people to come to him from all of the earth. Now, with this standard or rally point in mind, I think it's a really cool image in John 12 where Jesus says, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. 
I think he's building off of Isaiah. He, that he's saying, the cross, when I'm lifted up on the cross, that is going to be the banner. That's going to be the, the standard and the rallying point for all humanity to look and say, okay, I'm going to be drawn to God here at, at the cross. Uh, and again, we see the hostility between Israel and Judah disappear. Okay? Ephraim and Judah no longer fighting, harassing each other. Instead, now they're unified and they're actually having victory over their enemies, like the Philistines and Edom and Moab and Ammon. Uh, in verse 15, he says he'll destroy the tongue of the, of the Sea of Egypt. Uh, this probably refers to like the tongue-shaped part of the Red Sea that the Israelites crossed over to escape from Egypt. Uh, so he's going to destroy the sea that was keeping them in bondage. And then he's going to destroy the Euphrates River of the Assyrians and sort of like divide it up into seven tiny streams so that it loses its power and people are now free to cross to and fro from it. So it, it's kind of a picture of God destroying national borders and boundaries to so that now there's unity between the nations and people are just, you know, freely crossing over from one nation to the other because, because they're all unified now. They don't need all these dividing... Um, waters like the Euphrates and the Red Sea to keep them separate and to keep people divided and in bondage. I really don't get that verse 14. I mean, I, I understand verse 14. the flow of what's going through. Yeah. But now it's, it was talking before about peace. Yeah. And, and now it goes back to war and vengeance upon their enemy. It just seems out of place with the, the flow of what he was saying. Yeah, I hear you. Um, and I... I guess it's just this, this concept that once we're Christians, we, we are going to have victory over our enemies, those that oppose and persecute us, um, Satan, his demonic forces. I think he's just using these, uh, like the Philistines and the Edomites and the Moabites and the Ammonites, because those traditionally have been the enemies of God's people. So he's sort of using them as like a, a symbol for the enemies of God. And so... It, it's a dual picture, right? It's like there's a part of Christianity where um, we have our enemies, enemies of each other are now at peace, like we were talking about before, like the Jew and the Gentile and all that. Um, but if you think about it, the way, that, the way that we get our enemies to be at peace with us is considered a victory. It's the way that I destroy my enemies is with love and self-sacrifice, and then they become Christians, and now they're at peace with me. So that's why I think the peace and the war thing, like the peace in verse 13 and the war in verse 14 go together, because the way that we're warring against our enemies is with the armor of God, and we're making our enemies be at peace with us. That's how we actually defeat the enemies. I don't know if that's helpful, or if I'm making it worse. But. So is all of that language figurative? Well, in 11... Well, I think it's figurative in this. It's figurative. It doesn't really happen, right? Historically, it doesn't happen. Right. Like if you're Crossing looking. borders and, and. Right. Christian nationalists, in a way. A nation of Christians. You don't really have. Correct. Correct. It's more yes, it's okay. figurative. To describe something that's real, a, a real peace, but. Yeah, I don't think God actually went and literally like destroyed the Euphrates River, yeah. you know, okay. um, or dried up the Red Sea. Okay. I think he's just using that image of, hey, the Red Sea is no longer keeping you in bondage. It's no longer keeping you separate into your separate nations. You all have this beautiful unity. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, I, literally, like, we're not going and doing battle against the Philistines, okay. right? But, but the Philistines are being used as symbolic of our enemies, and Christians are going to defeat their enemies. How are we going to defeat them? Well, with love and sacrifice, the way Jesus did, making our enemies one with God and, and with us so that we can have peace. So that's why the peace and the war thing go together, because as Christians, we, we go to war in order to make peace. It's, it's a kind of a paradox. <laughs> well, I mean, he's, raised, he, he's talked about this, this battle we've been in this entire chapter. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the signal's been raised yeah. in the very first verse. Yes. Um, you know, but it's, it's, I mean, you said, it's about, about, about the unity of there the one who raises the banner to mm -hmm. look for the peace. Yeah. It is the war for peace, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think it's interesting at the, at the very end there, as, as far as um, 
to have peace, you must have war. Mm. Right? We are in a war as Christians. The Bible says that we're in war. Mm. Or in a spiritual war, too. Yeah. So it's, it's looking at it in, in, not in the realms of physical fighting, but it's the... You know, the spiritual forces. Yeah, and that's the thing that Paul makes clear. We're not actually at war like with our neighbor. Like we're at war with Satan and, and the spiritual forces of wickedness that has a hold over our neighbor, that has a stronghold over our neighbor. Paul talks about this in, in 2 Corinthians 10 that we, that, you know, we have to take every thought captive to Christ, right? That we, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, but but we, we destroy speculations and every lofty thought that exalts itself above Jesus. So, so we're going out and using the truth to change minds. And we're using love to change hearts. And that's how Satan's stronghold in people's hearts and minds is, is destroyed and weakened. And we, we defeat our real enemy, Satan, and then our neighbor becomes our Christian brother or sister. Yeah, it's really, I mean, you can't make this stuff. <laughs> like, you're not going to tell me a man just wrote the Bible, right? And uh, Just man-made, God had nothing to do with this. No, because this is totally opposite from the way that human beings think. And it's, that's why it's hard for us to get our minds around the, the imagery. Yeah. A good, good question. Um, so verse 16, he presents this as a new exodus for God's people as he opens a highway for them, just like he did through the Red Sea. Um, and, and just like God saved the Israelites from Egypt by his power, so too when Jesus comes to restore his faithful remnant from captivity, it'll only by, be by his power and might. And, and once, they, once we've been set free, we're entering into this new kingdom where we have peace with each other, victory over our enemies. And interestingly here, the highway is pictured as leading us back to God. But Isaiah will mention this highway in other places. Look in Isaiah 40. Look in Isaiah 40. Because here, Isaiah speaks of the highway as leading God back to us. So in Isaiah 40, in verse 3, he says, A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Um, who quotes this in the New Testament? Yeah, John the Baptist, right? So by preaching repentance, John was clearing off the highway of any debris and any obstacles getting in the way of Jesus coming to save his people. So Jesus came down this highway first to get us, and then he takes us by the hand to lead us down this highway back home to God. Okay, so it's kind of cool how, you know, in Isaiah 11, it's a highway leading us back to God. In Isaiah 40, it's a highway leading God to us first. And so God came to us, in his son, and now he's taking us down this highway home, free from captivity. Really awesome. Again, rich, rich imagery. Any questions, comments, applications uh, from chapter 11? All right. Well, after the exodus from Egypt, do you remember what Moses and the Israelites did right afterwards? They sang a song. Yeah, they sang a song of praise. Uh, for his salvation. And that is what we see in Isaiah 12, after the new Exodus in Christ. Uh, in fact, Exodus 15, 2 says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. We'll look at Isaiah 12 in verse 2, the second part. The Lord God is my strength and song, he has become my salvation. It's the same, same quote from Exodus 15. Okay, so this is a new Exodus, a spiritual Exodus. And now we're praising God for his salvation. So verse 1, Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For although you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Um, remember all those verses? <clears throat> we saw where the phrase was repeated, In spite of all this, his anger does not turn away, and his hand is still stretched out. Finally now, in verse 1 here in chapter 12, his anger is turned away. Now there's comfort. In the Messianic kingdom, um, 
God is no longer angry and, and out to punish his people because Jesus came to take God's anger and punishment upon himself. And now in this kingdom, people finally realize we can trust God for salvation. I mean, that's the core of Isaiah. God's trying to tell his people, I save. Stop trusting in idols. Stop trusting in political alliances and your own wisdom. And now, you know, once Jesus comes on the cross, now everybody gets it. Now we finally get, yes, salvation is from God. Uh, it's like we sung this morning, right? No boast. I'm not going to boast in anything. No gifts or power of mine. Okay, May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says in Galatians 6, 14. Um, all boasting and self-reliance ends when the cross comes. And, and in, the Messiah, in the Messianic kingdom, we'll have this endless supply of salvation. We'll have an eternal fountain of joy because of it. We'll be calling on God every day in prayer and telling everyone that we can not about his marvelous works of salvation that he accomplished on the cross. And the greatest reason for our joy is that the Holy One of Israel will be in our midst. It's the perfect bookend, really, to this whole section from chapters 1 through 12, um, because this whole section has been about how the Holy One of Israel is angry with his people. Yet he promises one day he'll dwell with them on Mount Zion. Even the child born of a virgin would be a sign that God would be with his people. And now in the Messiah, God has finally come. It essentially associates the Messiah with God because the Messiah coming means that the Holy One of Israel is now dwelling with his people. The Messiah is God, and he's the solution to that, to that problem. Remember the question we asked at the very beginning, how can a holy God dwell with such an unholy people? The Messiah is the answer to that question. And when you really step back and you consider what God accomplished through Christ, not just for us personally, but the peace that he brought to the remotest parts of the earth and the church, it just boggles the mind. You just can't help but praise him and thank him for the rest of your life. And you might recognize... This is reflected in one of our modern-day songs. Uh, he is in our midst. Uh, the, the phrase, draw from the springs of salvation, is from verse 3. Give thanks to his great and holy name, verse 4. Make known his deeds among the people, verse 4. Call on his name with thanksgiving, also from verse 4. Joyously praise his name in song, is verse 5. In the chorus, praise the Lord and shout and cry for joy, for the Holy One is in our midst. Well, that's, that's from verse 6. Uh, and so I actually want us to finish by singing this song, and I'll lead it in a little bit of a lower key so that we don't be super loud. Um, uh, where's my app? Here we go. Because uh, I just think the song is so much more meaningful when you realize he's just quoting straight from Isaiah 12. Uh, whoops. Uh, let me lower it. Mm -hmm. Draw from the Springs of salvation, give thanks to his great and holy name. Make known his deeds among the people, make known his exalted way. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord. and shout and cry for joy, for the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord, and shout and cry for joy, for He is in our midst. Call on His name with thanksgiving, yet joyously praise His name in song. Through love He authored our salvation, through love He did give His Son. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord and shout and cry for joy, for the Holy One is in our midst. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord and shout and cry for joy, for He is in our midst. Man. So much more meaningful, I think, when you understand um, that, that he's pulling that from Isaiah 12, and we're singing about the new exodus in Christ. We're singing about this new grand restoration from captivity through the Messiah, through the shoot that will stem from Jesse. Um, hope that's been helpful. We'll pick up in uh, chapter 13 on Wednesday night. It sort of starts a new section, and now he's coming after the king of Babylon. So thank you guys very much. If you have any other comments or questions, you can come to me afterwards. It was funny that